Thank you, Ralph, for the kind introduction, and thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, I must say that uh, my, uh, my background is urban planning. In fact, I graduated from the University of Waterloo 30 years next month. But my presentation today is coming from a municipal cultural planning perspective. I was not the uh, city planner on the file in the past. I, was not the city, I am not the city planner for Liberty Village currently. So um, I should start by just giving a little uh, orientation. Liberty Village, you're doing the project on it, you know exactly where it is. The point I want to make is it's not an isolated island, even though it's abutting the Gardner, the railway tracks. It's next to some pretty dynamic uh, neighborhoods. Uh, Parkdale, uh, the one that I've been most familiar with, West Queen West, uh, Trinity Bellwoods, and the Niagara neighborhood, as well as Fort York. Interestingly, um, and, and to, to follow on Michael's um, uh, presentation, uh, the hypergrowth has been amazing in downtown Toronto. Toronto currently is the development capital of North America. There are more construction cranes in Toronto than there are New York City and Mexico City combined. And interesting, last week I was speaking with Prue Roby, who's vice president of Artscape. Artscape's head office is in Liberty Village. And uh, Artscape, as you might know, is a not-for-profit developer that creates affordable and sustainable creative spaces while transforming communities. And what her point was, was eight years ago when she joined Artscape, there were no development pressures. There was none of the construction cranes that we see today. Um, so the, the task, as I understand it, is to sort of peek behind the curtain and, and make some observations and share that with you as it relates to the unhappy development of the east portion of Liberty Village. And I think there's a number of things that can be said uh, uh, that sort of went off the rails some. Uh, there's a few good things that have happened, but certainly I think we can uh, figure out the lessons learned going forward for the western uh, side. So the first thing I would say is these uh, condos, the vertical village, uh, they go up fast. It is fast money. And there's one thing about City Hall, we do not move fast. The, that's the private sector, the public end, the public realm, the parks, and all the other municipal infrastructure, we work on a 10-year capital budget. So we're always behind. The other thing that happened in the East uh, Liberty Village was early on, there was a design charrette. And I've been involved in design charrettes, I'm sure you people, all, all you have as well. And this one, unfortunately, uh, well, well-intentioned, I think city staff felt that they were backed into a corner some, and it didn't have the rigorous analysis after the design charrette. So the floor plates were too deep, they, they, may, they, they, they didn't uh, work out as well as, as uh, it could have been. The other thing about East Liberty Village is one owner, not much infrastructure, like a re regular uh, street grid system. Um, and then there's the politics. What was supposed to happen to connect Liberty Village up with uh, the rest of the downtown was something called the Front Street Extension, and that got axed. Um, one ownership as opposed to multiple ownerships, uh, and one big property for the most part. Um, and then with regards to <clears throat> density, uh, there were a few, um, if you had to go back, things that would have been done differently. So one of the things was uh, the density um, was three times coverage, which sounds pretty decent. Uh, that was what city staff had, had thought would work. Uh, but it was not um, done block by block. It was just three times density. And so you had some uh, blocks 
which were very suburban in nature. I'm thinking of the sort of the strip mall with Dominion Metro uh, grocery store. And then others that were pretty uh, densely, uh, there was a lot of density there uh, because it was able to be uh, moved around. The other thing, and this is where you really should be sweating the details, is that density, well, three times coverage doesn't sound too much. Uh, the, the zoning bylaws were written such that uh, it was um, including, it was gross, it was including the road, the road allowance. So when you take out the roads and the road allowance and you, and you put the three times density onto the private property, it gets a little bulky. So in the end, I think uh, what, what the uh, past planner said was well-intentioned, but what ended up was not exactly something that had all the benefits of a point tower or something that was more um, uh, lower grade, um, a good relationship to the street level. It was more like warehouses on steroids. So um, there, then there was a few other things that sort of went off the rails, uh, and that would be uh, the Committee of Adjustment. Um, death by a thousand cuts. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of smart lawyers out there and they're typically driving the bus. And so uh, either at the Committee of Adjustment or at the Ontario Municipal Board, uh, one planner said, uh, the, the uh, municipal lawyer for the developer said, well, um, oops, sorry. Uh, can you tell the difference between a 50-story and a 58-story uh, condo? Personally, I couldn't. So it was a lot of a little nip, a little tuck, and these buildings got bigger and bigger. So death by a thousand cuts. Um, having said that, there were some wins. I mean, there were a bit of heritage uh, structures that were, were kept. Uh, there was the prison chapel, which I understand is going to be a watering hole for uh, the, the condo owners. Um, and, and also the suburban type strip mall with the grocery store where you, you look at it and you say, how did that happen? That just, does, like, how did that happen? Well, Toronto has been called a city of disposable buildings. And that is, uh, as I understand it, one of them because that is an interim use. There is much more density assigned to that particular block. And so um, it, it will not be there uh, years from now. The good news, uh, West, the western portion of Liberty Village. Um, there is a real understanding of the adaptive reuse of industrial heritage buildings. Uh, the Toronto Carpet Factory is just an excellent example. Um, it's, uh, the the, the uh, developers uh, talk about their uh, repurposing these buildings with invisible mending. I mean, there's a real uh, good sense of, of the appreciation of heritage. You can see that there's lots of large blocks left to develop. There's a proper street grid. Uh, there's many owners, and um, also going forward, well, there is the Front Street uh, Liberty, or sorry, well, the Front Street extension was cancelled. There is underway uh, and will be rolled out a new uh, Liberty Street, which will connect Liberty Village with the um, Also, going back to my first slide, uh, it's important not just to have streets that uh, uh, connect Liberty Village with the rest of the downtown, but there is the long-awaited Fort York pedestrian cycling uh, bridge. That is to roll out in 2017, and I understand that the template for, for this particular project has been um, uh, 
uh, well received and, and it's working well and money permitting there will be a, a further connection uh, to knit uh, Liberty Village with other downtown neighboring uh, communities. So going forward, uh, Michael talked about the hyper growth. Uh, it is just incredible. My introduction to the hyper growth was <laughs> West Queen West. And um, I had left urban planning. I, I, work in the Economic Development and Culture Office. And uh, when the developers descended uh, out, like in mass on West Queen West, which was really brownfields, it was an industrial wasteland, uh, except it was cheap. And it was um, uh, where artists and creative industries were located. And I was getting calls from uh, the, the, the artists from the uh, Active 18, a residence association, saying, what are you going to do? And I thought, oh, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and quite frankly, uh, it was a really tough uh, go because I left planning. And, and yet I felt like I needed to do something. And so I, I'm, this something is municipal cultural planning. And so... Um, Late, late <laughs> in my career, I, did, did I get a real appreciation for research and policy? And this was the project that did it. This was the one, because I thought, how do I insert myself? How do I help the artist? How do I help the community in um, the, the, the complete uh, crazy development pressures and gentrification that was happening? So this was like 2006, 2007. And that's when, thankfully, uh, Heli Kill, um, uh, uh, oh, uh, Hill Research, Kelly Hill Research, had done, just completed a study, coast to coast to coast. And the study was looking at concentrations of artists. Where did they live? And it was postal code by postal code the whole country. And this postal code, M6J, uh, ranked as number five in all of Canada. So we're talking between the Drake and uh, the Gladstone, CAMH, MOCA, and this particular swath of land, uh, fifth highest con concentration of artists. So what I found myself in uh, was an expert witness at the Ontario Municipal Board. And it was a consolidated hearing. There were, it was 35 days. There was the city that was a party, the rail, railway, and three developers. And so what I was there, because I convinced my colleagues in planning that this was really important, this neighborhood, and that artists and creative industries really needed to be protected. And so it wasn't, this was actually precedent setting because it wasn't uh, a, a hearing about, well it was, about height and density, massing, conceptual design, public realm, you know, the whole, the whole infrastructure it was also about arts and culture, and it was about employment. And so I remember my uh, two days on the stand, and I did the best I could, best um, improvising my uh, Richard Florida uh, shtick. And I, I, this was an exhibit that um, was submitted to the board uh, and, and it's the first cultural map that I had ever done. And basically what it was, what I was trying to show was this little triangle, West Queen West, was an ecosystem. It was everything from the P.M. Bowman School of Dance for underprivileged children to places of entertainment like the Drake, like Mocha, like the Gladstone. It was bookended with artscape, 
um, uh, live workspace and artscape in Parkdale uh, workspace. Uh, it had down in Liberty Village, it had Artscape <coughs> head office. In Liberty Village, there was Chorus Entertainment at the time. Of course, it's still in Toronto, it's now on the waterfront. Um, there were um, uh, art supply stores, there was uh, Nomad uh, Theater Company called the Theater Center. There was a whole ecosystem of artists and creative industries and they needed to be protected. And we argued that because we were, we were trying to be fair and to be truthful, uh, we, were, uh, we weren't ahead of the curve. As Gary Wright at the time, the chief planner, said, we dropped the ball. We, we, we're not ahead of the curve. We didn't have a secondary plan for the triangle. So again, we made it up as we went along, but we were fair. So what we decided to do was we said, uh, we want going forward, you can have your vertical village, you can do the condos, but we would like there to be a no net loss, non-residential, non-retail. Now we have spun that a little um, more positively since that time. So basically what we're looking, what we would like to see is a net gain of non-residential. And so that's what we pitched. It was fair. And we gave a copy of Richard Florida's first book, The Rise of the Creative Class, to all the, the developers, all parties, to the chair of the OMB. Uh, after, you know, every day, 35 days, the chair wrote copious notes. It, it, looked, it, looked, it looked like it was going well. And uh, in the end, the 17-page decision came out. And uh, the mayor at the time, David Miller, was so disappointed, so disappointed, he couldn't even finish reading the decision from the OMB. Uh, it was bad, we got nothing. City got nothing. And it was like, oh my goodness, if you're not gonna save this triangle, which is the fifth highest concentration of artists in all of Canada, where do you pick your fight? So what do you do when you lose at the OMB? Uh, your options are very limited. Um, you go to the courts on a point of law. And we found something. We found something. And uh, the thing about going to court, doesn't matter what it is, is somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. So nobody wants, nobody wants to go to court. So who's going to blink first? Anyway, it was this whole mashup and, you know, Artscape, pitted against the city, Active 18, doing deals with this developer, this developer, settle it. Anyway, we did a settlement, and I think there was some pretty uh, significant Section 37 um, benefits. Uh, we got a uh, performing arts hub. We got a, a visual arts hub, um, uh, you know, m monies towards all these things. Um, but it was, it was pretty hurly-burly, and, it, and, and it, was, it was pretty nasty, actually. So, but it was, you know, it was training wheels. It was training wheels. So next, uh, <laughs> this is the big enchilada. So uh, it, this is the biggest project any of us at City Hall have worked on. And um, uh, to say how big it was, the rezoning official plan amendment application fee, the fee that David Mervish wrote was a um, million dollars, just to process this. And where to begin? Where to begin? Um, you know, it was, it was light view privacy, it was heightened density, it was massing, it was the public realm, it was the uses, it was, it was the, 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 the heritage and so forth. And again, I'm, you know, I was in the planning department, I'm now not in the planning department, but I felt that, um, that there might be something that we could contribute uh, from our end. Uh, and, and so I looked at the laundry list of all the things that needed to be worked through, 
And it seemed to me on the list, even, even though heritage was there, there were two things that weren't there. And one was arts and culture, and two was employment. And so again, uh, it was a, uh, uh, a case of how do we insert ourselves, how can we help out here, and again, policy and research. You can't lose. And, and so um, there, there was a document that we just finished the year before the uh, Mervish Gary uh, project was filed. And it's called From the Ground Up, Growing Toronto's Cultural Sector. And it's interesting that this document was a collaboration of the City of Toronto, the University of Waterloo, U of T, OCAD U, as well as ERA architects and a number of uh, designers. And basically what we did, or we, well, there's a lot of things that we did in this, in this, uh, in this policy document, but one of the, the, the research pieces uh, that we came up with was uh, something called the Cultural Location Index. And basically we took every census track in Toronto and we looked at where the uh, uh, people are living, where the people, the artists are living, where the creative employment is, and where are the cultural facilities. And where the, where the um, creative industries are working is at King and John. It's at King and John, it's right there. It's right there. And so with that information, uh, which is all census data and, and backed up by a report, we put together a, uh, a one page, double sided, so two pages, I guess, um, a briefing note to say, you know what, arts and culture is important. And Michael showed you the culture plan, right? And, and we have this other document, this other policy document, that shows that, that the, the jobs are here. The Googles, the, the landscape architects, the graphic designers, the architect firms, they're all there. So please, Mr. Gary, please, Mr. Mervish, don't knock the heritage warehouses where all that great global, globally competing jobs are, are, are located. Don't wipe it out. Don't wipe out the Princess of Wales Theatre and, and put a, a four-story uh, retail podium that will compete with the Eaton Centre. No, no. It, we, this, is, this, this stuff is more important than Le Chateau. So, <laughs> but you know what was really interesting is you couldn't argue you couldn't argue, I mean, it was, yes, it was just two pages, but it was pretty high octane in that, you know what, you, you, you couldn't say, yeah, yeah, forget, that's all fluffy stuff. No, 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 we'd worked so hard for the last dozen years to get to this point that we were able to be articulate, use research, use policy, and in the end, in the end what happened was Frank Gehry's architects flew from LA to Toronto, LA to Toronto, and it was collaborative. And there was no OMB hearing. And we saved a lot of time and a lot of money, and people are happy. And that's what I'm hoping will happen in the western portion of Liberty Village. Thank you.